The Liberty Truck was designed by the Motor Transport Section of the Quartermaster Corps in cooperation with members of the Society of Automotive Engineers. Production of the 3 to 5 ton truck began in 1917 and the first models appeared 10 weeks after the design was standardized. Of the almost 9,500 trucks produced by 15 manufacturers, more than 7,500 were sent overseas. The Liberty's four-speed transmission coupled with its 52 horsepower engine gave the truck a top speed of about 15 miles per hour. During the punitive raids in Mexico during 1916, the Army had experience with motorized trucks. It was obvious that the truck's mobility, endurance, and speed far exceeded the ability of the conventional horse-drawn wagon, but maintenance was a nightmare. The Quartermaster Corps realized that a truck of standard design and interchangeable parts was a requirement for the Army. A committee was formed of Quartermaster Officers, Society of Automotive Engineers, and volunteers from the truck manufacturing companies to design a standard Army truck. The design committee agreed that a 3-5 to five ton large cargo hauler was the most critical need for the Army. The truck needed a large engine, large gas tank, large radiator, and maximum ground clearance. The committee also agreed not to use existing commercial designs in order to avoid delay in production by patent infringement. By October of 1917, two prototype trucks were driven overland to the War Department in Washington, D.C. for extensive trials. The results were so successful that by mid-November, the government had signed contracts for all the interchangeable components. The Liberty Trucks powertrain utilized a gasoline-powered 425 cubic inch flathead inline four cylinder that produced 52 horsepower with a four speed transmission and a four by two drive setup. In March of 1916, a Mexican revolutionary leader named Pancho Villa attacked Columbus, New Mexico. The U.S. reaction was swift. Ordered by President Wilson to capture Pancho Villa by whatever means necessary, General John J. Pershing mounted an expedition comprised of regular and National Guard troops in the Federal Service. To supply his force, Pershing called for five motor transport supply trains of 27 vehicles each. Since the entire Army possessed less than a thousand motor vehicles of all types at the time, Pershing's demands seemed outrageous. Nevertheless, he got what he asked for, and the expedition proceeded into Mexico. As the campaign proceeded, there was a need for more motor transport, until over 500 vehicles were assigned to the expedition. A supply depot of spare parts was established in Columbus, New Mexico, which was a jumping-off point for the expedition. The troops penetrated 400 miles into Mexico. The Army had trucks from 128 different manufacturers. The parts supply system was a nightmare. Maintenance and repair for the vehicles was beyond the capability of the Army at the time, so it was necessary to hire civilian mechanics. There was also a scramble to recruit soldiers with mechanical aptitude or experience. After 11 months, the U.S. and Mexican governments negotiated their differences. Pancho Villa was never captured, but the Army did learn some lessons from the Mexican campaign. The days of the horse-drawn supply train were numbered. The new supply link between the railheads and the troops would be Army trucks. The manufacturing of Liberty trucks began in April of 1918 and did not stop till the end of the war. The first trucks reached France in October of 1918. After being manufactured in the United States in a safe shipping space, they were shipped in a partially disassembled state and assembly yards in France were set up to, to prepare the vehicles for use. By the end of the war, over 8,000 trucks had reached France. These rugged trucks utilizing available parts were easy to maintain and buttressed the entire war effort. Truck manufacturers in 1918 had produced 10 times the number of trucks they produced in 1912. Some of the Michigan companies that were involved in the design and manufacture of the Liberty Truck are Republic Motor Truck Company, Alma, Michigan, Denby Motor Truck Company, Detroit, Michigan, Packard Motor Car Company, Detroit, Michigan, Russell Axle Company, North Detroit, Michigan, Timken Detroit Axle Company, Detroit, Michigan, 
Hinkley Motor Company, Detroit, Michigan. Continental Motor Company, Detroit, Michigan. McCord Manufacturing Company, Detroit, Michigan. Covert Gear Company, Detroit, Michigan. And Detroit Gear and Machine Company from Detroit, Michigan. The Liberty Truck holds a unique place in American history. It was one of the first contracts between the American military and the automobile companies. This allowed the military to tap into the vast economic resources of the automobile companies with its assembly line manufacturing. This allowed the American military to ramp up production of weapons when needed. They also would have a supply of spare parts in order to maintain the weapons and they could train a class of technicians called mechanics in order to keep these operating. This also helped the transition from horse and mule transport to motor transport which would be most important 20 years later during World War II as the United States had the most advanced motor transport corps in the world. Finally, the Liberty truck could go almost anywhere at any time and this allowed the military and civilian companies to determine which was the cheapest way to send their goods and services, whether it was across the country, across the state, or even across town. The Liberty truck ushered in a new era for the American military. They were no longer dominated by rail or horse transportation. With the truck, they could go anywhere at any time. Transcontinental Motor Convoy in the summer of 1919, a young lieutenant colonel named Dwight D. Eisenhower participated in the 1st Army Transcontinental Motor Convoy. The expedition consisted of 81 motorized Army vehicles that crossed the United States from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, a venture covering 3,251 miles in 62 days. The expedition was manned by 24 officers and 258 enlisted men. The convoy was to test the mobility of the military during wartime conditions. As an observer for the War Department, Lieutenant Colonel Eisenhower learned firsthand of the difficulties faced in traveling great distances on roads that were impassable, and that resulted in frequent breakdowns of the military vehicles. These early experiences influenced later decisions concerning the building of the interstate highway system during his presidential administration. In 1956, President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. It has touched every American in one way or another. It's considered to be his most important achievement during his two terms in office.